am so glad to be back in London. This is my first international trip since COVID, so I'm glad to be spending it with you guys. And this is how to become a unicorn or die trying. So, uh, hold on. What just happened? Okay, so how many of you have dreamed ever about becoming a billionaire? All right. I mean, really thought about it. Like, what would you do with the money? Yeah, I mean, so how would your life change because of it? Like, there's, there's a lot of people that have thought about this, right? Now, how many of you have thought about what it would take to become a billionaire? <laughs> Not as many, right? For the people who aren't lucky enough to inherit vast fortunes or unlucky, if statistics are to be believed, um, it's almost impossible to get there. Even including those people, there's only a 1 in 2.5 million chance of becoming a billionaire. You have an equal chance of being hit by, eaten by a hippopotamus and a better chance of being a real astronaut, not one of the ones that billionaires can uh, be. However, building a company worth that much, somehow that's easier. Building a company worth more than a billion dollars has a 1 in 333,000 chance of happening. That's an order of magnitude better. You're more likely to build a billion dollar company than to die in a fireworks explosion. So if you want to make billions, you should start a business with that goal in mind. Why do some, so many people love startup culture? It's cool. It's a new thing. Who doesn't want to be successful before they're 35 or retired by the time they're 40? Billion dollar companies are difficult to build because of the extreme conditions required. Today, we're going to go through a fast overview of the perfect storm that creates a unicorn company. All the gurus say you need a mentor to do this. There's a lot of growth and opportunity today, so your business is going to need a mentor who's been there and done that. But will they know exactly what it takes to make growth happen? Aspiring entrepreneurs frequently seek out veteran founders for guidance. They'll be attracted to people who have the perfect CEO lifestyle on Instagram and everyone's doing well online. It's super easy for everybody. They drive beautiful cars. They have such wonderful lives. You, on the other hand, are struggling to make ends meet. You become jealous when you see their postings and this happens to everyone. Trying to adapt Somebody else's life to your own, especially via the internet, is useless. You, can, you can't only consider somebody's current success to, and the results of their labor. You have to consider the labor itself. When you see someone who has a lot of knowledge, they learned it over time. When you see someone who has a lot of skills, they developed them over time. When you see someone who has done a lot, they accomplished it over time. And when you see someone who has a lot of money, they earned it over time. People should understand that there's a visible and an invisible component to every activity. The unseen component is the most crucial, determining the direction and the integrity of the scene. Most companies that are hailed as overnight successes are labored for a long time before bursting onto the scene. You also don't see the privileges and what successes occurred out of pure luck in timing, finances, relationships, or wealthy parents. Maybe their first big client was introduced to them by their parents. Maybe those same parents gave them a million dollar loan that helped them to start their company off the ground. Maybe they benefited from a Cambridge education. But because of our nature, we don't pay attention to the invisible, those moments of difficulty and even failure along the road, preferring to focus on the visible. That's more enticing to us, but there's no such thing as overnight success. It takes hard effort, devotion, and courage to demonstrate initiative in a world where some individuals are just paralyzed by fear. Some people may achieve success more quickly than others, but before you can find out how it happened, you first have to figure out why. Why would you even want to start a billion dollar company in the first place? You're wasting your time if it's only for money. Any worthwhile aim must be motivated by a strong reason. And money cannot be that motivator. Because as soon as you've made enough to live comfortably, you will stop. Money cannot be your driving force if you want to develop a billion dollar company. It will not work. Something more profound 
Something that motivates you will, must exist. There must be a burning cause that motivates you to keep going. We call that the drive. If you look in the backstory of Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, Kylie Jenner, Bill Gates, pick any successful entrepreneur and they all have the same story. For as long as they can remember, they've been focused on a goal to achieve and on building the skills they need to get there. Not only are they focused, they're relentless. They are obsessed with their vision of success. As soon as they achieve one thing, they find a new goal, but they keep leveling up and building new goals. Like all overnight successes, my own billion dollars journey started when I was in primary school. My father purchased me my first computer, and it was love at first sight. I shut myself away for days, learning how it worked both inside and out, and saved the extra pieces carefully in a box, just in case. I spent every spare hour learning new programming and skip scripting languages just for fun, and everything became easier because I was able to use those skills to my advantage. It was like I was a character in a game, and I just kept leveling up faster than the people around me. When I was at university, I used my programming skills to attract the attention of a major game studio, and they hired me in a position they created just for me. I've always been exceptionally goal-driven. I went all in on learning everything I could about computers. And when a, when a company called Infocom who made, and a company called Infocom who made video games. When I was in college, I started targeting the former employees of that company. I was stalking them, really, and people who were associated with them so I could learn from them. The approach worked, and it put me in the perfect place for the next level. Your own passion and skills are only a small but important part of the puzzle. You need an idea to execute from. You need something to focus your abilities on if you have that all-consuming passion and desire to achieve. Many entrepreneurs have a company concept, but what makes it a billion-dollar idea is there must be real value in what you're selling. Whatever product, service, or information you're selling must benefit others, a lot of others, without their having to explain it. The value has to be so simple that when people hear it, they'll be like, of course, why didn't I think of that before? Create a business that solves an issue that people face on a daily basis. Find a problem that affects you regularly and provide a solution to that. When a large number of individuals believe your solution has made their lives simpler, your little business can grow to be worth a million or a billion dollars. Without that type of idea, you're wasting your time. And all you have to do is do it better than literally everybody else. One evening, I was having dinner with my friend Phil Libin, and he was talking to me about a new startup idea he had. He was droning on and on in that excited way that entrepreneurs have when they're starting a new venture, and I was nodding politely and half listening. Honestly, I was more excited about keeping my, chopstick, my sushi from falling out of my chopsticks. Suddenly, the mood at the table changed. I put down the chopsticks and was staring at him, listening intently as he was describing a tool that would capture the ribbon of memories for your entire life. He had a vision that when he was 90 years old and his brain was starting to become faulty, this product he was creating would help him to remember everything. While building Evernote, we weren't the first productivity tool on the market, but we were always the first available on every platform, including Google Glass, which made your notes available everywhere. Our design made it easy for anyone to come in and use it without a tutorial. We provided a tool that was advertised to be available forever with easy portability should you choose to switch. In other words, we focused on delivering real value. When entrepreneurs say they want to change the world, billion-dollar ideas are the ones that mean it. You don't need to be the next Tesla, Amazon, or Google. You just need to solve a real-world problem that everyone has. Don't be afraid to establish large, bold, and daring objectives. The more you're willing to play, the more inspiring your mission will be to others. And that inspiration is key, as it will help you to attract valued heavy-hitter job prospects that want to assist you in achieving incredible results. The success or failure of a startup is determined by the individuals that make up the company. 
Ideas are a dime a dozen. It's the team and their ability to execute that makes a difference. The stronger and more consistent your company's vision is, the more your workers will be enthusiastic about it. For example, I've coached hundreds of companies, all with brilliant ideas for solving a widespread problem in the world, but without that ability to execute, they never grow into billion-dollar companies. It's also critical that you hire brilliant individuals who don't want or need to be taught what to do. Those individuals will attract other people who share their values and their belief in your mission. It's important to create a non-restrictive climate that fosters experimentation and risk-taking. You want your employees to feel as though they're part of something bigger than themselves. For example, who here has heard of Hello Parking? No? That's because in 2017, they had an opportunity to seize the moment, but their team didn't want to risk it. And now you've only heard of them, if at all, as a failed startup. It could have been a brilliant startup as it addressed a widespread problem, but they, be they failed to become a billion-dollar company. They failed to become a $100,000 company. Hire based on personality rather than based on credentials. You can teach skill. You can't teach kindness. This means collecting data about your ideal customers to create a hiring profile for your team. Hire experienced people who've worked in other businesses before to help grow your startup quickly, and leverage the efforts of early employees by giving them equity in the business. This means that any contractors you hire might be end up paying twice as much as your employees. So be careful hiring contractors early on, because your employees might be scared and sad if they find out how much those contractors are paid. That said, put power in the hands of staff by sharing company financial information, but with safeguards in place to avoid too much risk-taking behavior. This is easier with smaller teams, especially those below 20 staff members. Equally important is the team, and the idea is your financing. The goal of a business owner should be to develop a company, not a startup. As a result, the company must be able to support itself and not rely on the availability of angel investors. I cannot stress this point enough. You must have profits coming in, or you are not a business, you are a hobby. You are not focused on growing a business if you're only trying to get through the A round of capital raising, the B round, the C round, and so on. To put it another way, if you're seeking funds to meet a financial necessity, you have already lost. Don't be concerned about your exit plan. Concern yourself with how your company will benefit people while still generating money. In the case of a billion-dollar venture, when you're starting out, you're going to have to do a lot of experiments to drive growth quickly in the right direction, which is always up. Be willing to overcome those hurdles and keep moving forward quickly into the next generation of product development. Series A is intended to provide business with additional cash, do market research, and launch a product. It's usually the first round or second round of business investment. Series B is to provide expansion after creating your initial products. This is improving a brand, going into the market, and it's the hardest to get because investors do not want to give you Series B because you're very rarely proven at this point. But Series C investment, if you get Series C, you're on the track to becoming a billion-dollar company. This is to help you to go into the hypergrowth stage. In the early years of a startup, hypergrowth is often the focus. The phase is typically characterized by rapid growth in the number of customers, employees, and revenue. Hypergrowth requires a relentless focus on finding customers as opposed to generating profits, and a lot of business owners are scared at this. In other words, you spend more time acquiring users than investing in your products. So these are the steps required to achieve hypergrowth. First, strive to deliver the minimum viable product. As developers, we want to make everything perfect. We want to make everything good. Even with Agile, we hate delivering things with bugs. This means hiring less experienced staff, working with volunteers, and relying on less sophisticated technology. Once your team gets larger, transparency has to be balanced with your staff not stealing the company. So you, you have to be less secure. Making day-to-day -day decisions quickly rather than putting them off until things slow down. Using good enough quality standards rather than perfecting everything before it goes out the door. Hi, Rocket users. 
Avoid two common mistakes that are often made by startups, failing to understand the customer's motivations and failing to encourage cross-functional collaboration across departments. Cut your losses early rather than switching to profit-oriented revenue models. This means maximizing your funnel before spending more money on a complex paid marketing strategy. Do those micro-experiments. Unlock viral growth early on in the life cycle of the business. Viral growth is that holy grail of startups as it cuts costs of customer acquisition dramatically. Then embrace the growth hacker title early on in the life cycle of the business. Growth hackers think like entrepreneurs, but they have engineering skills to build products effectively. This person's also responsible for new acquisition. And expand internationally at a rapid pace, but only after you have the data to do so. Um, and then you get to convert everyone to your cult along the way. Then you have to capitalize on those supply side economies of scale to create a technically scalable market from day one. In this case, everything is tested before you scale any bit of the product and automate everything you can to the greatest possible extent. This means spending more time on the maintenance of your product rather than adding new features. So we build up that tech debt early on, but somebody will fix it later. Hypergrowth can be followed by a period of cons consolidation and improvement where you bring much needed changes to your business model and then focus on profitability, finally. But I mean, by this time you're kicked out as CEO, so does it matter? There's tons of reasons to go for the gold, but here's all those reasons that you shouldn't. You're going to need a lot of cash. Because your startup's going to require a large sum of money, you'll be continuously fundraising rather than concentrating on the product. Have you ever considered starting a business because you enjoy the industry? Instead, you're going to be spending half your time on financing, probably more. You're taking a big risk. You have to make huge investments ahead of actual data if you want to achieve hypergrowth. Because many of these bets are going to lose, this technique is inefficient. You're going to give up a large amount of control. Raising a large sum of money will dilute your ownership. If you sell 80% of your stock before exiting, your company needs to be worth 500% more for you and your employees to make the same amount of money. A lot of people will be involved in looking for a share of your profits and gains, which reduces your own income. If you plan to sell your company, it may be difficult to find a buyer, because why would somebody buy an unproven company, and why would you want to sell a business that's making money? You'll have to fight for everything. Don't expect investors or clients to let you keep any of the equity or profits without a fight. And you have to work more under pro pressure. In Silicon Valley, there's a lot of pressure to make things happen as fast as possible. In order for you to make it a su as a successful founder, you have to do this as well. You'll face many challenges and adversity that may lead your business into a bankruptcy or failure. It's crucial to hire the appropriate individuals and create a positive culture. Hypergrowth, on the other hand, entails employers recruiting recruiters to hire managers to hire recruiters in order to hire as many people as possible, and then it just keeps going on. This means that you can't create a culture that sustains itself. You have to retain and recruit entire, uh, talented individuals, and you can't keep the best people. Your company will look more like a factory than a family. If your startup is successful, you're going to have a lot of employees working for your brand. In order to stay competitive in the market, you're going to need to increase production levels, which turns your workplace into a factory. You'll have to work so hard, you won't have time to enjoy your life. I've hit this lottery multiple times. I've been a founding employee of Evernote. I've been at a studio acquired by THQ, consulted for Zappos, and I'm also friends with some of those billionaires that people aspire to be. To a man, we've all spent more time focused on work than our life, and even convinced ourselves that work was our life. Microdosing, extreme fasting, and other radical treatments run rampant as people try to push their bodies farther than they're supposed to go, just so they can work more towards their business goal. I'm not immune. I've lost family, some good friends, and permanently damaged my own health along my journey. The right way to work is to focus on your vision rather than spending all your energy on a goal that doesn't make you happy. If the only way you can serve your passion is doing your job, do it. But take some time to figure out if that's really the case. 
Don't let a to-do list dictate who you are, and don't sacrifice the things that make you a better person. Don't let anyone tell you what your passion should be. That's something that you need to learn on your own. Sure, the word billion has a nice ring to it, but there's so much work to get there. You have to be relentless, and you'll be giving up so much. I know keynotes are meant to be inspiring, so if you've taken anything away from my talk today, I do hope it's this. If all the things I've said today have confirmed to you that you're meant to be an entrepreneur and to try and attain that goal, great, I've done my job. If all the things I've said today have confirmed to you that you're meant to stay the hell away from entrepreneurship and keep working nine to five, great, I've done my job. As for me, for my personal journey, nothing compares to the feeling of knowing that people around the world use the things you've created every day. Thank you.